doors and there's a complex outcomes. Uh, so the, the premise for this sprint is assume that physical distancing is going to be a reality for society for multiple years. So in other words, um, the society, the, the virus is not going to magically disappear. The vaccine is not going to instantly give us um, complete herd immunity. And some forms of physical distancing will actually need to be implemented for the long haul. I think that what we've seen is that um, governments went from zero to a lot for total shutdowns and then tried to open quickly. And so they're still trying to find where the equilibrium point is on these things. And so for this project, we were trying to take a little bit longer term view and say, OK, instead of focusing on how we get back to normal, instead, let's figure out what actually a new normal can look like in, in a way, something that's sustainable. Um, so part of that effort, which we'll talk about in two weeks, is building actually actual sensor platforms to try and monitor indoor spaces and see what that data looks like. So it's a combination of CO2, motion sensors, object detection, uh, other capabilities. Um, and that that is very much in, in line with um, the efforts of the previous air quality work where we're taking low cost sensors, we're bringing them together and we're deploying them in interesting ways, looking at what the data looks like and then seeing how we might actually be able to use those um, in a thoughtful manner. So that's two weeks from now, though. What what we want to talk about uh, for this conclave is the other part of the effort, which is, OK, if we assume that we're going to have to have some sort of physical distancing for the long haul, what does that mean? Then what is what do different aspects of society look like? What sort of policies would need to be put in place? And then how do we message those? So we did a, a variation on world building, which is a sort of classical world building. You bring a lot of different people with a lot of different expertise. You make some assumptions about what's what will happen or what's going on in the world. And then you do a deep dive into looking at all facets of society. So uh, a group of us have been working for the last uh, a month and a half or so. And our main working sheet is this spreadsheet that you see. So basically what we did was we broke down society and policy into these areas you see in yellow. Um, and then for each of these broad areas, two, two different... So in one case, we're looking at an application. So what's a possible tech application or what would uh, what would actually be something, some sort of policy or rule that would need to be implemented? What would be the implication for that area? And then what's the messaging? Because I think we what we've seen is that messaging has been very mixed and arguably pretty ineffective um, in part because because of the mixed messaging that's been going on. And then the other piece that that we folded into this was considering uh, what level you're actually looking at. So we, we're, we're looking at different scales here. So for instance, work and finances, how an individual is actually going to deal with uh, long-term physical distancing, then applications, implications, messaging for families, neighborhoods, cities, states, countries in the world. And each of these different scales, uh, you can you could you could imagine that there will be some overlaps and there will be some things that are distinct for this. And this is why you kind of do the experiment and lay out this master grid. So this this has been the the master document where we've just been dumping, the uh, the work that people have been doing as they as they think through these efforts and so um, been working through so for instance um, for work and finances you can see that 
um, here we've got a number of, of bullet points looking at applications, implications, messaging uh, at many levels. So this is things that are sort of scale independent and then things that are particular to an individual scale for this. Um, and then similarly for school and learning, um, what, what happened is as we worked through this, we began to see that there were overlaps. There were some things that were somewhat scale independent, which I think is a whole interesting topic in and of itself. Um, but then as you go down through the spreadsheet, then for education, there's a breakdown. You can, because K through 12 is probably a different set of problems and solutions than higher ed. Um, and then you can walk, walk through all of this data. And then similarly, you can see that there's a lot of stuff here. So now we've got this storehouse and this is a living document. So we can continue to add to this, modify, um, improve it, think differently about things. But then it comes down to, okay, um, how can we actually get people to engage with this information? Because um, a spreadsheet, a big matrix like this is unwieldy. As you can see, as I walk through it, it's not something that briefs very well. So this is where the messaging piece of this comes. And um, we took some different approaches to this. Uh, we can talk a little bit, one of the framing, we use different framings. So for instance, some, some, some of what I had done around um, entertainment and recreation was using the day in the life framing. So you pick a participant. Um, it could be somebody who's a provider or somebody who's a consumer. Uh, I broke it down into consumers versus creators. And you imagine a day in the life with regards to entertainment or recreation. So in my case, it was, I created a PowerPoint deck where uh, I put a pool lifeguard and a musician and somebody who wants to go to the movies. And that's one sort of framing mechanism. But um, the, the students that have been involved in this have been doing some more visual uh, prototyping to try and get at this. So uh, I will pass it off. I think, Annie, didn't you say you were willing to be the, the first guinea pig here? Yes. So I will see the screen. And Annie, if you can talk a little bit about what what your area was and then sort of what your approach was and cool um i guess so i i'll start with this one um so i guess well one thing i was thinking about with messaging in terms of messaging is how you know it's pretty negative um out there and i don't know that negative messaging is helping anyone so i found this video um, it's like a TikTok video, which I will, I copied and here it is. Um, but um, like trying to use, sorry. There it is. But yeah, like trying to use like humor, um, incorporate humor, you know, this, I mean, that is how people in the US are acting now, like with their masks everywhere, like, so as far as policy, trying to plan for that, just kind of like assume that that's going to happen rather than, you know, relying on people to not cough and, you know, wear masks like on public transportation or in the grocery stores. So um, on this slide, I focused on that and just like, um, you know, setting ways to set up public places like grocery stores, et cetera, so that you know, there's contactless payment, people are paying with their phones, more scanning, um, and really like sealing off those like bus drivers. Um, and then also having a plan in place for people who are making others unsafe and, and like having a protocol if that is like, you know, at a hotel, for instance, um, I was reading about people who leave like a mess in the hotel room um and it's like you know having ways to charge them for that you know like if you violate this this is going to happen um things like that uh and then on the other ones i focused 
Um, the other uh, group, I guess, is focused on, there's a lot of gaps right now um, uh, that aren't being met, like new needs, new demands. Um, and so I started, the first one I did was on childcare. Obviously, that's been shaken up. Um, you know, it's not as, you know, you can't, people are less interested to send their child out of the home. So getting a ways that the kid can entertain themselves in a stimulating way, not just staring at a screen again, but like actually doing something. Um, and which would also open up opportunities for people, especially in artistic fields who are probably looking for work right now, artists, young people, et cetera. And then the next two slides, I'm thinking about separating these into missing data and then one just on coordination because there's a lot of needs there that aren't being met. Um, you know, things related to COVID, like where people are thinking that they contracted it and just getting information on people's uh, trajectories with COVID because pretty much the focus seems to be on the extreme cases in healthcare, which obviously, but um, you know, when you look at the bell curve, there's a lot of people who aren't, who are like self-treating and it's like, well, what's going on with them? And then also the different strains, what are the nuances? Um, people who are still affected months later, what's going on there? Because it's definitely not a one size all, one size fits all thing as is uh, often being presented even in hospitals. Um, so, and then similarly in other, uh, pretty much in all sectors, there's information that, you know, like agriculture and food and navigating that um, and just like making sure that there's improved communication and data sharing uh, because it doesn't necessarily seem like that's happening. Well, I mean, it's not happening now. Um, and then similarly, and then I focused also more on capturing the full COVID spectrum, uh, especially in regards to self-treaters. And there have been things that have been found to be helpful, but um, you know, American society at least is very focused on, you know, having the official cure and just like getting more information, more research potentially on these other things that people have been finding successful. Um, and then, yeah, and then this lastly about uh, just like different ways to think about entertainment um, and ways to create communities, just like ways for people to have meaningful experiences with one another and or potentially meet new people in a safe way where they don't start arguing. Um, yeah, so that's that. So yeah, I would love feedback. Um, so I am curious about the um, about the 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 angle on shedding more light on people's self treating. So, so yeah. one of the things we have that, that that might be interesting would be to explore how a positive message shedding light on on self treatment changes or changes people's um, in, beliefs on on COVID. Like there are lots of people who will say sunshine is the best treatment or something like that. Like, does this is there? I guess I'm I'm wondering if there's a tension between shedding a light on alternative forms of exploring treatment and conspiracy theories around COVID. Like, how do we balance that um, oh. that you know, dy dynamic there? Yeah, that's a that was something I was thinking about too. Is there's so much bad information, um, and so like, which I mean I don't, not to say that sun is like maybe that is something that is effective but like putting I think that is also like people want to see it from a formal source um so if that's research or whoever um but and doctors even I guess yeah so maybe figuring out like hesitancies of like why doctors aren't giving out this information and um working with that um 
but yeah, that's a, definitely a good point because there's a lot of opportunities for misinformation, as we've already seen with the chloroform thing. Uh, yeah, one of the th I think part of the the dynamic there is how does how do you communicate um, probabilistic risk to a to a lay audience? Like I, I got the sense that a lot of the communication early on in the in the pandemic, the reticence to recommend things was because even though there was limited evidence in favor of some new treatment, there it wasn't entirely 100 percent clear that it was that that benefit was always going to be there. And so trying to tell a public that uh, there's a 60, 70, 80 percent chance that this is a good thing to do. Seems like it might not play well when people don't really understand what those probabilities mean in real life. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I, I agree. I guess I also feel though, like in this case, that's all we have so far. And so something is better than nothing to like explain it with the like, okay, like this has worked for, you know, people who experience it in their stomachs, like ginger, for instance, like maybe it's helpful there, maybe, and then um, for respiratory, Maybe it's ginger, maybe it's the berry um, that I was reading about, like, um, but kind of like if people can, I mean, also those are inexpensive things to get. It's not a prescription. They can get it and then, you know, just like try, uh, like have a more flexible, proactive mentality rather than just waiting for something to finally happen. Um, yeah. Uh, Shande, just a quick uh, follow up to your point on uh, people's understanding of probabilities. Um, how would you as a data scientist think like what would be the more ideal way of presenting and reinforcing that point without uh, being, uh, you know, tilted in either uh, direction? to conservative versus uh, to hyperbolic. Uh, I, I feel like it, climate science is also something that, that suffers from this problem along with a lot of other fields. And I think so, one way of addressing that, just looking at this framework, uh, seems to be focusing a lot more on the individual and family levels rather than global or state or country levels. Uh, because, uh, but yeah, an individual story would likely have a lot more impact than statistics of how the world is suffering from uh, global hunger or migration or any of those problems. What are your thoughts on that? So, so it's interesting that you, you you highlight the the importance of an individual story. I, I feel like the the entire one of one of the key um, dynamics when dealing with statistics is that statistics in the social decision making setting is. You're, you're necessarily talking about aggregates, how aggregates respond to certain types of interventions. So pulling back from the aggregate perspective down to down to an individual story can be tough. Um, I, I think I don't really have an answer for you. Um, I, I think, uh, yeah, um, Justin also pointed out that weather modeling has the same problem and and uh, Todd is pointing out that animations and maps might might be might be a good way to go on this. Um, I, I think historically, for for most data scientists working in the tech space in in the policy space, there was a sense that the the decision maker, the consumer of the of the data product, is sophisticated enough to sort of absorb what probabilities mean in in their decision making. Um, but that doesn't really hold. That, that's that assumption doesn't really hold when the humor is now the general public. And so I can imagine that things like, um, yeah, if you can come up with a compelling animation, even if it's simplified, I can imagine that that might be more compelling. Yeah, but I, I, I yeah, I don't have an answer for you because I think uh, there are levels of, of sophistication that is required to really absorb statistics in a useful way. And then if you're focusing just on an individual level, then you, I feel like you run the risk of, of you know, ex trying to explain a complex thing with just one data point. 
Yeah, what we could do would be say um, like use micro sim uh, micro simulations or agent based models in an ex in in a public facing manner. So you say, okay, ah, uh, this guy on flowing data, Nathan Yao does a good job of this. He'll give you life course trajectories for a particular like if he's talking about data analysis of marriage, he'll create a simple simulation model that shows if you're this type of person with these characteristics. Here are things that are likely to happen to you over the course of your life. So that's a nice way of taking uh, an individual story and sort of infusing um, aggregate statistics information into uh, the visualization of that of that stuff. Um, I, I, I don't I don't have enough information on how well that's absorbed by the lay person, but it seems to me more more powerful than just presenting them with numbers on divorce rates and stuff like that. I guess I'm always a little concerned about agent based modeling and trying to tell people what they would do based on characteristics because one there's always the thing the rule in physics where like if you once you observe the experiment you affect the experiment and then the other is you know it discounts the fact that people grow and change and evolve. Yeah yeah there, there's a sense that Good time. Yeah, talk about it. Oh, the, I was going to say the other piece of that is that um, people always believe that they're the exception. Especially with COVID. <laughs> yeah, so if if 95% of the people are going to get sick, I'm going to be the 5%. Mm -hmm. and, and except for those who are hypochondriacs, in which case 99% will stay healthy, then the hypochondriacs assume that they're the 1%. So it, it depends heavily on psychology. Yeah, the issue of the issue of people that's a huge problem. Like even in the modeling world, like like how do you how do you account for how people observing information change their behaviors and therefore change change the policy problem? Um, yeah, again, some amount of sophistication is, is going to be required for many consumer of these types of products. And I don't know if that's too much to ask. So that means we have to think of something else. Cool. All right, Annie, the, that, that was your, that's your last one? Yes. Cool. Uh, I, I, so Jalal, you had said you had to punch out early do you have to go like now? Um, I, I can stay for another five, 10 minutes, yeah. Could, could you real quick throw up your pyramid? Oh, sure. See my screen. Yep. Okay. Hang on one. Yeah, there we go. Um so yeah, I just did a quick uh, visualization of uh, the individual family, neighborhood, global levels uh, that Todd was describing earlier in the Excel sheet uh, and looked at just the implications of uh, uh, a world with long-term physical distancing and masks. Um, so this, uh, I started, actually started with this cluttered diagram, which would uh, definitely give you a headache if you try to focus too much. And then um, this is the final iteration I was working on. Um, so as you can see at the top, we have uh, the individual level. And then as we go down, um, uh, we reach the global or uh, world level. And the transparency of, of the bonds on the right uh, side of the slideshow 
uh, kind of the uh, relationships uh, that one would generally observe. And we went a little back and forth on uh, how the pyramid could be a representation, I feel like, um, given that our context is the US, it makes sense to have the individual at the top and then uh, the rest of the levels below, but we could imagine a, an inverted pyramid in a, in a utopian socialist world, let's say. Um, but uh, anyway, so the scale at the very bottom, uh, if you notice the negative impact and positive impact, and then uh, at the center, I have no impact uh, due to COVID. And this basically deals with uh, whether or not long-term physical distancing and masks would have uh, a positive or negative impacts on these five uh, different levels. Um, as you can see on the individual family and neighborhood scale, this uh, and even the state scale, uh, there's mostly negative impacts because of uh, a continued world where virtual or hybrid education is the norm. Uh, but on a global scale and maybe on a country level, and again, these are just. Uh, 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 are you sorry. tapping on something? No, there was a knock on my. Oh, okay. Sorry. Good delivery. <laughs> Talking about imagining a new world. Um, but yeah, anyway, so these are. Uh, overall implications of uh, a reimagined educational system, if you will. Um, and I think one could use a similar pyramid uh, topology to look at solutions and how, uh, for example, solutions for an individual might actually be beneficial or not for on the family and neighborhood levels uh, as well. Um, yeah, I'm happy to hear your thoughts on this representation and whether or not uh, it makes any sense. So the just to clarify, the the fade going from individual to world is reflecting the idea that that there is less of an impact from a global education perspective? Um, no, so how I saw it was how um, there's there's less of uh, of an impact of individual choices or family related uh, choices that families make, for example, on a higher or more uh, global level. Uh, so it's the links between these different between these five different um, um, I, I don't know, things that we're looking at. Uh, yeah, but uh, I wonder if uh, one could argue that an individual uh, implication could have more consequences on the, let's say, on the neighborhood level than on the family level. Uh, but this was just uh, the uh, layman understanding of how uh, individual uh, implications due to this new world would impact family more or neighborhood more. So I feel like an individual would impact his or her own family. I actually had an arrow going between individual and family just showing, showing uh, kind of the uh, relationship between different actions that an individual takes. There, there's an interesting, the scale independence factor is interesting as well, because I wonder whether or not now it's much, it's much easier for an individual to actually participate in, in a countrywide or a, or a global education setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I did uh, try to capture that in uh, the country and global levels. Um, the fact that uh, 
like individual uh, advances in re virtual or remote learning uh, to benefit individuals might have a trickle down effect on uh, a global or country level in terms of a need to rethink inclusive education and uh, have a better uh, you know technological uses uh, in the field of education. So, so uh, on, on that point, I'm curious, this issue of, of um, being virtual, allowing for more impact at the, or for an individual at the, at the national level. I, I, I guess I, 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 one of my, my questions, there will be more voice or more impact. So like I can imagine people being more engaged and saying more things, but will, they actually, will their complaints or dissent actually have uh, an influence on how the the country evolves or how they are like the state evolves in, in terms of decision making and I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to play out yeah the, it could play in either direction i agree but i i think just the fact that people are talking about um education related equity outcomes uh would in some way have uh uh, more macro impact, even if we just start by collecting data that would highlight differences in uh, educational outcomes, for example. I think that was my line of thinking. I think the other piece is that if there, if this hadn't happened and there wasn't that opportunity for mm -hmm. the interaction, then you know there would be no impact. Right. So at mm. least even mm. if it doesn't directly lead to impact, you're you're moving towards that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's it I think it's necessary, but not sufficient would be probably my guess. Yeah. And I think if we look at the global level there, I was looking at a couple of reports quickly and it looks like um, there is a lot of talk about, for example, the increase in financing gap to reach sustainable development goal four, which is universal primary education. So at least people are talking about the fact that the, the for example, the bottom billion are the worst affected because of COVID. And so there would be an 18% increase in uh, the, finance, the financing gap to achieve those development targets uh, pre-COVID versus post-COVID. Uh, and that could in turn uh, result in an increased international contribution towards uh, uh, developing the education sector. There's also kind of a time scale component to this too, right? Because individuals might be impacted first and the effects might not trickle down or trickle up in this case to uh, the country level for a few years or in the case of education you might not see the long-term impact from uh, like loss of human capital for example um, you might not see that impact for five to ten years when the students students like elementary middle school students now are going into the, the labor force. Nice. I'd be, I'd be curious to, maybe it forms a nice natural experiment for how, how much of the investment in, in early education affects productivity in, in during working years. Um, I'm sure there are going to be lots of papers written about that. Yeah, now I'm trying to figure out how we add a so we've got a scale which is a geographic scale how we uh, add a time scale we need about a five dimensional spreadsheet i think mm -hmm. I, I, this aaron's comment actually made me think about how we're looking at it from a, a long-term perspective what's long term for imagining a world with long-term physical distancing is it a year is it a couple years uh, I think we were going under the assumption of a couple of years. Um, I think Aaron brings up an interesting point of even if the 
if the physical distancing is implemented for say it's three years that there's a knock on effect um and yeah i don't think that we've pondered that we're we've we've bit off a lot already um but the temporal aspect is a whole other a whole other interesting question mm -hmm. cool thanks jalal so heather hi uh let me go ahead and share my screen All right, can everyone uh, see my screen? Yep. Awesome, thank you, Arnie. Um, so actually, before I begin, I, I wanted to briefly mention that, so it was a couple of us that worked on this and we all chose categories and intersections, but um, we all worked on it. So these are not all like, completely my words. And um, although I know Annie and Jalar are here, also uh, Joan Chang and Eddie Lopez were also um, instrumental in the gigantic Excel sheet that you just saw. Um, so I originally tried to put all components into it, but I decided that I thought it was too much information um, at a time. So I decided to just focus on city and state and world in regards to health. Um, so I did application, implication, and messaging. Um, sorry. Uh, sorry. So um, I decided to kind of go the infographic route and in the aspects of the little icons, I feel like you can say a lot with just a few words and it's probably more likely that you'll have people actually read it, hopefully. Um, so I guess I'll go, I'll break down some of the aspects on it. So the big thing with city and state is that they're dictating a lot of the policies that we're kind of going through. So even down to some of the things like Jalal was saying, like down to like when schools are gonna open are all based off of regulations that are based off of California or the district or city that you live in. So um, increased health screenings overall and temperature checks everywhere you go, loss of employer and health insurance, greater reliance on government agencies like the CDC for health gu guidelines. Um, so the fact that everyone has to wear a mask and anyone over three years old for going doctor's appointments is also very common, um, which is also none, this is something that transcends into, into the world and some of the health impacts it'll have in the future. Um, so something else I've seen a lot of is, I'm sure as Kaiser members, you've all received emails of all of the different app capabilities that we have in regards to anxiety or just coping with self-care and those aspects as well. Um, I also want to mention that one of the things that we discussed prior to making the graphics was the idea of like developed nations and those that are not so much. So evidently the fact that we can use our phones to you know, do mindfulness and such is not something that everyone is able to do. So I'm sure we've all heard of telehealth and the fact that we're able to do it again on our phones and we all have high quality internet. That is not something that is capable for many. And as a matter of fact, even here in the United States, a lot of the telehealth is only for large medical providers. So if you're going to a doctor that he, you know, his practice is on his own, more than likely you're not able to do telehealth. But these large organizations are able to because you know they have the the budget to do it, but um, these individual doctors are not willing to put in the means because this that's only living, you know, in, in the COVID world of now. Maybe it's, you know, needed right now or maybe in a year or two, but in the far future, that may not be the case. Or that's what I've heard um, doctors talk about as to why they're not willing to put, you know, thousands of dollars into the infrastructure of creating a telehealth system. So something else that's, um, I, I foresee happening is a greater reliance on the Affordable Care Act. So I know that there's a lot of limbo as to what health insurance is going to look like, especially the ACA and how that will work. And I'm sure we'll see that sooner than later. So um, 
But of course, we all know that when the ACA came around, a lot of people who were uninsured were eventually able to be insured. And now with you know millions of people losing their jobs, you will also have millions of people that are going to need insurance because they lost their employer provided insurance. Um, so that also means that you're also going to be these individuals are now going to need these safety net health providers, which are, you know, federally qualified health centers that they have free or reduced payment scheduling. So another uh, fun thing, I guess, is exercising from home is a lot more popular. Again, um, I know like the Peloton bike or something along those lines is that's definitely a more developed nation kind of implication. But, um, you know, the gyms are closed and all that. So you have to do it in a different way. So um, as far as the messaging goes, uh, typically, and I know we kind of briefly mentioned this. So like as far as health messaging, the way that it usually works or public health anyway, is that you're supposed to have messaging that's for the eighth grade level just to make sure that it's it, the lay audience can see it and of course translate it in as many languages as possible. And it is typically uh, tailored to an individual. And I'm going to say that that's mostly because when you think of health behaviors, all the models that are used to change health behaviors are in the individual level um, for the most part. Um, so this one is actually a billboard here in California um, and like the hashtag masks up and I actually I saw it on the news because people were not happy with it because it was like too much. And I also I also saw one the other day um, that said something along the lines of 13,000 Californians have died masks up. So just, you know, like scare tactic, but not really just scare tactic because it also, it's, you know, it's true. Um, I also wanted to make sure that I kind of highlighted social justice and, and racial equity. Um, so I, I won't go through all of it, but I did want to make sure that I like included all the demographics, uh, demographic groups uh, and some of the um, dis disparities with cases, deaths and hospitalization. So I did choose, you know, one for each, but I, I will say that African-Americans were these categories. Um, so just an FYI. So for world application, so increased importance in health outcomes. So especially for people that have comorbidities, you know, if you have um, diabetes or if you have asthma or anything like that, you know that you're more likely to have more severe complications. So reliance on global health organizations. So decreased preventative care, I think is actually a really big one. So I don't remember the statistic, but basically like having a colonoscopy, having a mammogram, these have all declined like in heavily. And with that are going to come some of the implications that I talk about here. So nobody knows, but basically we're all scared of all of the untreated cancer diagnoses that we'll see um, or cardiovascular disease that are not that, that are basically going untreated right now because people are not going to the doctor because they're scared to get sick. Um, so something that you don't see as much, but I, I really um, one of my passions are disabled individuals. So um, in the UK, actually, a third of the people that have died from COVID have uh, had a disability. So you don't see it as much, but you know they're more prone to getting sick and having more complications because they're already med medically fragile. So yeah, um, another big one is the uptake of immunization, which I spelled wrong, sorry. Uh, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was something like 80% of immunization around the world has gone down. So of course you can see that if there's a measles, a mumps, a rubella outbreak, that's really bad for all these kids that are not vaccinated. And in case you forgot about vaccinations, vaccinations are booster shots for most of them. One, two, three, you know, four for some. And if you only have one, you are not completely vaccinated. You are still susceptible. And, you know, all these parents are not going in to get these immunizations. And they could be really bad in the not even far future. So, um, so greater demand for health data. So, of course, we all probably go on Twitter or whatever handle we have to check and see how many COVID cases we have. But uh, something that I will tie into like uh, social justice and racial equity is that actually in the beginning or the first few months, there was missing data, um, for, uh, particularly for race and ethnicity. Um, so, you know, uh, here being at RAND, we all think about like causal implications and such. Uh, so you want them to be similar um, populations, but with the race ethnicity issue, the way that everyone is, um, I guess, acquiring their data is different so it's kind of funny but not like some people put hispanic as a race and some people some people put african-american as an ethnicity so that means that the data is all kinds of messed up and not to mention that in the very beginning the first two or three months that aspect was missing for 50 percent of the covid data and it's still a problem it's not perfect 
and of course it's like i said it doesn't match so it's kind of hard to see what it's going to look like in this in, in the future or even currently what that story really tells so uh disruption to health services is more so low and middle income countries but it's literally at 90 percent of people just stopped going to and it's not just preventative care um it's everything um, so greater demand for effective contact tracing methods. I'm sure we've all seen in the news the different things that we're trying to do and unable to do. Um, and then the video, this is a video on the bottom for the messaging. It's uh, a video from the World Health, World Health Organization that I really uh, enjoyed because it kind of, you know, tailors to all kinds of cultures and individuals. And it's actually about the vaccine, which I won't go into, um, the accelerator, but um, yeah, that's it. So. And, was going to try to make one for education, but I didn't get the chance. So I'm happy to hear any feedback. Thank you. I think you've covered everything. It was really good. Is the mask is the masks up a, a trending? Is that a hashtag that's out there now? Yes, if you go on Twitter, you will see people taking pictures with their masks and that's it, in their cars and just out and about. Yeah, it is. So I had put a question in chat. So the, you know, one of the things that you have in there is greater reliance on global health organizations, but I, I'm, I, there also seems to be increased nationalism um and that's globally and then even within the united states i would call it as increased statism because you see these you know one of the hallmarks of covid was new york versus nebraska or new york versus south dakota for instance um so i it i i don't know that there's even a question there other than i i I wonder how we're going to deal with that, because I agree that having global health organizations and having health data that transcends borders is important, but I, I'm not sure if that's going to be counteracted by this um, protecting your own mentality. You know, I, I'm honestly not sure, and I, I kind of try to contemplate like uh, czars and thinking about that kind of aspect, I would say that it'll be unique to every nation. I mean, un unfortunately, there's been a lot of uh, interesting rhetorics here in the United States as to, you know, who is to blame for this, and there is a people to blame for this. So uh, I, I don't think that that's something that is, you know, everywhere. So I, I would think that it's unique to every place and how they're getting the news and who their leadership is and what the leadership says. Um, So, so on the on the on the social justice and racial equity thing and the lack of data to to sort of um, highlight the the disparities, um, one of the things that comes out in sort of um, audit work, audit for fairness, audit for for inequalities of any of any form, is the the audits can be if if the audits are done, it doesn't necessarily help us think through how to actually improve the fairness outcome. And so there's a sense that, OK, suppose we collected all the data with the right with the right sensitive attributes, in this case, race. Like the the next step would be to try to dismantle the systemic nature of the, the factors that cause the disparity. And I'm not sure. I guess I, I, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how much of a will there is in the United States to actually do that work, because it's going to be hard work. Uh, it's just a general comment as opposed to a, a question. Yeah, no, I, I I completely agree with you. I I will say that I think there is a, a platform now to kind of hopefully continue to do that work. But I haven't, I, but from what I've read, I haven't seen anything that will change it anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, but, something that, I guess your graphic, it's, it's really great and it's really pretty too. Um, something that uh, I think about with uh, the racial equity and social justice part is um, you have this graphic grouped by city and state versus world, 
But if you think about um, like race is kind of a proxy for the the inequity, um, but it's like aspects of race. So one thing that comes to mind is different states and cities are doing different things things during COVID. So if you think about um, a lot of the states in the South, I think there are like 13 states in America that don't have um, Medicaid. And so mm -hmm. there's like an overrepresentation of like, for example, the African-American community in states that don't have as many social assistance programs. And so thinking about like what the future looks like in terms of like the services that exist or not and how different states might it might play out. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I think what you said is, is spot on, like that it, it's a proxy at the end of the day. So I'm from Florida. We didn't expand. It's sad. I hate saying that I'm from Florida sometimes. Um, but yeah, I would totally say that. And that's why you see, I mean, Florida was Florida and, you know, our safety net hospitals were just inundated. And I'm sure that that's probably the case for the other places. And I would I would assume that the health outcomes would mirror that statement that you just mentioned. Even even more so now with everybody that doesn't have health insurance um, and, you know, maybe doesn't have the capabilities of going to go get a test and all of that as easily as some of us do. So I think that's one reason why we included scale in this uh, and, and specifically articulated and put it in the spreadsheet and then into the thinking, because it it is it's it's so much more complex because even if you're thinking at the city and state level uh karishma as you note different states have different approaches to things so um you know then then it's even within within a city you have different neighborhoods that have different different approaches and different attitudes towards towards it so um it's a it's a messy problem Cool. Well, we're almost at 12. Um, so hopefully uh, those of you who, who, who weren't working on this, uh, on this particular effort found some of this interesting. Uh, I, I think those of us that are working on definitely did. There's, um, it's a, it's a really big problem set. Um, and this is just scratching the surface. I think the, the visualization and the messaging piece, we've talked about a lot of other things of, you know, video and do you do a tweet a day and how can you, you know, are, are hashtags one solution to try and getting this across? I, I think the whole messaging um, question changed late last night. Um, so I, I think we're it's going to be very interesting to see what plays out the next over the next couple of days and next couple of weeks around the messaging and, and how some of this plays out. Um, it's we, we live in interesting times. So uh, I, I want to thank Annie and Jalal and Heather for um, presenting their work. It's it's all work in progress so uh and it's all prototyping as you can see a number of different approaches to presenting the information and part of it until you start actually trying to present and display the information that's that's kind of when you start you realize that all of the thinking and work that you had done there's actually a whole other set of working and thinking that has to be done in order to to try and present the stuff. So um, that's awesome. And then Aaron did drop a, an image in the chat for the teaser. So two weeks from now, um, we'll be talking about the same overarching problem, but a very different approach. And in this case, it's prototyping hardware and software, and then looking at data and seeing whether or not we can actually monitor indoor spaces that would help facilitate um, us executing on a new normal, whatever that is. So, uh, Ashunde, any last, you want the last word? Uh, 
uh, I, I guess I'll say something. I, I, I'm curious on this messaging question um, as a final thing to think about going forward. Um, messaging and, and behavior. What? How do we think through the link between those two things? How does, like, how do we think more carefully about how certain messages are absorbed and how those messages um, motivate different types of actions? I I don't have an answer to that, which is why I'm asking that question. Uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, that's why marketing, good marketing companies, make a lot of money. Cool. All righty, everyone. Thanks. We will, uh, and we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next time. And uh, uh, masks up. <laughs>